What's up, guys and gals? Welcome back to the Nerd Castle. Today in the world of indie games, we'll be checking out a title called Between the Stars. We haven't covered this one in a very, very, very long time, and that's largely because the game hadn't really had any updates in a really, really long time. Now, the developers sort of ran out of money on this one. I always got the feeling that this was like somebody's like first project. Uh, it definitely has some amateur decisions when it comes to like the UI layout and things of that nature but this is an open world battle cruiser RPG that focuses on big badass ships slamming into one another with enormous amounts of firepower and that I think scratches a particular itch that a lot of other space games do not satisfy so today we're gonna be taking a look at the game because the developers back they've just released the final chapter of the game uh, they had to take a hiatus from putting updates on this game largely due to the fact that they ran out of money I think so they had to finance a game called Traveler's Rest in order to raise money we covered Traveler's Rest Traveler's Rest was quite the successful little game made a bit of money and so as promised they've come back to between the stars and are now working on it once more so today you're gonna join me for about 25 30 minutes we're gonna blow up some spaceships I'm gonna show you how customizable the game is what we can do with our battle cruiser maybe get ourselves into trouble but up until then let's get this thing moving so in Between the Stars, it's got a little bit of a different setup than I think a lot of other open world space games. So there's a lot of open world space games out there, and most of them I think are probably as mum as possible about talking about who your character is, what their identity was before they become the main character of the game, so as to give the player an effective sandbox to fool around in. This game goes in a different direction. You are actually kind of like an upper ranking, like right below Admiral, effectively, member of the Star Republic, or like the Space Republic, or I don't know, dude, there's some kind of republic in space. We are a part of that, and it's kind of like Starfleet. We have a chain of command. We have a job to do. I right now have a gunship that I use as a patrol boat, and you can take on missions. You can take on tasks from the authority, or you can just follow the main storyline, which actually, I'll tell you, for all the flaws that this game has, the main storyline is actually quite good. And along the way, you're going to be assembling a fleet, you're going to be putting together ship loadouts, you're going to be assembling a crew, all of whom have different skills and different levels and things like that. Uh, there is actually boarding combat and things like that in this game. It's very, very simple. But the best way that I would describe this game to anybody is that it's basically like a visual novel that also has like a playable ship portion. So like back when I was a kid, uh, there were sort of like these single player versions of like D&D or of like the Star Wars tabletop game. And in those single player versions, it was effectively like a choose your own adventure book, but you had a D20, right? And you would roll that D20 when you got to certain spots in the book to figure out where you're going. And you had like a little stat sheet. This game actually is a lot like that with like battle cruiser gameplay on the in-between. This is actually a very verbose, heavy reading game with lots of decision making and lots of running storylines inside of it. And I think that's what the game does very, very well. Uh, right now, I'm actually at port. I wanted to take a look and see if I could find anything that would kind of like punch us up a little bit, make us a tiny bit stronger. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we have that here. Uh, I did get to repair my ship, though, and I also need to repair my escort. Technically, there's lots of escorts in space, by the way. It's a very, it's a very freewheeling place. I would like to pick up a secondary escort, actually. It looks like we can get Captain Abdule Thobi right here. You know, let's go ahead and pick him up. And we'll go to our loadout menu and we'll put our second escort ship in right there. And then every single ship has different hard points. Uh, they have red hard points and they have blue hard points. Red hard points are guns. Uh, blue hard points are going to be support systems. And so were I to click on this right here, uh, he doesn't really have any support systems ready to rock right now. The good news is this place has like a couple of things that we can look at. I'd probably buy the flat cannon for him just to protect him from missiles and a laser interceptor maybe. And then from there, maybe like some plasma cannons? I don't really know what I want to do with this guy. I'll give it some thought, but we're spending a lot of money here. This is my ship, by the way, the Infinite Borealis. On this side, this is the ship that we just bought, so I get to kit it out. I'm going to put two missile... So these basically shoot down missiles. Uh, these are point defense. And so you can put shields in blue slots, you can put point defense in blue slots, you can put all kinds of supplementary gear, uh, you can put like a nuclear launch silo inside of there, so that you can fire nuclear bombs at the enemy if you want to, which basically one shot like everything. Uh, this game is very high on the rule of cool, but what we need to do with this craft is they do have a decent rocket system. We'll put that on the back end of the ship. 
These guys are going to need something that knocks out shields. So I would suggest maybe we throw a plasma artillery cannon in there. We do have some rockets, though. And I find that the AI does pretty well with rockets. Rockets in this game, they penetrate shields. So missiles go straight through shields. Plus, they look really satisfying in this game. You can tell that they sort of like modeled missiles in this game after LRMs from Mech Warrior because they fire very similarly and it's super satisfying. I'll probably offload the rest of this because I just spent like all my money and so I kind of need to get my fleet finances back up real fast just in the off chance uh, that we end up having to spend a whole lot of cash. But anyways, all of these things are upgradable. We'll talk about the different crafting that exists inside the game world a little bit later. Hey, there's our new ship right there. You'll see him following us around. Every ship in this game, I know I just skipped out on a thought right there when I made that edit. I know that I did it. Uh, every ship in this game is cruiser class or larger, and there are quite a few of them. And that's honestly one of those things that I like about this game very much, is that there aren't very many games out there that focus on, like, cruiser combat. There's a ton of games out there that focus on, like, space fighters. But I couldn't be less interested in space fighters. I don't care about fighters. I like piloting the ships that are, like, I don't know like destroyer class or larger, like corvette class or larger. I like the big ships firing broadsides, so things like Battlefleet Gothic tend to be very, very fun for me. Looks like we're being jumped in on by a number of enemies. It's okay because I have a highly optimized build right now that absolutely melts enemy ships. Uh, when in combat, you do have to watch out for your fire right there. You look at the left side of the reticle, your guns do overheat uh, while you're firing them. Overheating your guns means you can't fire for a while and you've just got to kind of like float and get pounded on. Right now, the storyline, our Galactic Republic is at war with a group of terrorists from the outer fringe called, uh, I think, the Children of the Sun, uh, who have sneak attacked the Republic and basically killed a whole bunch of our best ships. In the fighting, our best technologically advanced ship got disabled. Their best technologically advanced ship also got disabled. So the game's got kind of like an interesting storyline. Sorry, there's like these pop-up events that happen like really, really frequently uh, while you're flying around. And that's where like the visual novel portion of this game comes in where like you're testing your stats and rolling D10s to figure out what happens. Unfortunately, I'm not ready to show you that yet because we're still getting into the swing of things with the video. And so the storyline is kind of like both of these galactic empires are sort of like toothless right now. They're fighting with their lesser fleets, but by and large, uh, they have both lost their technological advantage and are kind of like scrambling in this arms race to get their super weapon before the other guy gets their super weapon. And so it's a very, very go, go, go storyline told from a high level of command. Like we're almost an admiral in this game. Like our character's rank is quite high. Like they've said that they would have promoted us to fleet admiral, but there was a recent admiral that kind of went rogue. And so promotions aren't really happening right now because they're vetting everybody. Uh, but the communication screen lights up and a captain of a ship appears in a visibly precarious state of health. We've run out of supplies and I don't think we can get to a space station before we starve. Can you give us some food? Giving them our provisions costs us credit since we'll have to buy more at the next station that we visit. Yeah, I mean, it's our job. We're basically space cops. That's what we do out here. Like, we're in a gunship and we're patrolling the area to, like, help people out and... You know, make sure they don't die of horrible diseases or if they get attacked by pirates, we intervene. We're, we're effectively law enforcement as this branch of the military. A flight in this game is not crazy complicated. You will notice that it's pretty big and pretty sluggish. That's because the ships are really large. Uh, your scroll wheel basically controls how fast you're driving. Uh, they don't give you any type of speedometer or anything else like that. This game has a big problem with not giving you enough information to make educated decisions about what you're doing with your ship. And it's very, very difficult to tell a lot of the time whether or not something that you equipped, like what the firing arc is of it, or, you know, like how fast am I flying right now, things like that. Uh, the captain of the other ship thanks you for the gesture and offers us the cargo that he carried in the hold. It's a radar dish. All right, I'll take it. Apparently these guys just ran out of food, and that's it. Uh, every single system, so this is how big the game world is for right now. It's not exceptionally large, but I've been playing for, I think, 17 hours now on this particular save. And during that 17 hours, I've really only, like, made it out to, like, this chunk right here. And I've mostly, there's repeatable content in this, so there are contracts you can pick up from the Fleet Authority to, like, go investigate piracy 
or to deliver goods and just act as a logistical manager for, for the military. Uh, sometimes those will end up with you rubbing elbows with civilians and getting embroiled in much larger storylines. I like it when that happens a lot, in fact, when you pick up a randomized quest and it has a trigger inside of it that like triggers another not-so-randomized quest uh, that you get to continue that's directly related to the randomized quest. That's a really, really cool innovation. I like that. I wish more games had that. But the randomized content takes two different formats. Uh, there will be, where do I need to go for like jobs that I have right now? We need to go to Memoria Asta. All right, we'll go to Memoria Asta. Uh, repeatable content in this game takes two different forms. There's distress signals. Investigating distress signals usually gives you a visual novel portion. Uh, the storylines have all been quite good. So this game, this game is really, really odd in that regard, where like there's some parts of it that are definitely like low rent and not done very well and like things that just weren't thought through very well. And then there's other parts of the game, like the narrative portions that are done really, really well, or like the visual portion of the game, which is done really, really well. And so this was an odd one to call, but there's distress signals. Anything can happen at a distress signal. A distress signal is effectively a self-packaged little storyline, or maybe you'll just get there and it'll be a fight. You never quite know. Uh, some of them, about half of them, seem to be storylines. Some of them very, very good. Uh, there's been two or three that I liked a lot that I showed up for distress signals, where it was like six or seven pages of reading and making some dice rolls, but I really, really enjoyed the writing and the storyline. I think that's a thing that this game knocks out of the park, is that they're little... Oh, they just called me to the bridge. Like I said, these little text things pop up all the time. And they don't, like, appear to have a very long cooldown. Uh, you find yourself on the ship's bridge when suddenly an asteroid a few dozen meters in size appears in your trajectory. The pilot evades it at the very last moment, avoiding a head-on collision. Well done, Helmsman. You congratulate the Helmsman for his excellent work and ask him to keep up the piloting. That's a repeat. I've seen that one before. But the first time you do that event right there, in case you were wondering... Uh, your captain, if we go to the crew compartment, your captain picks up these perks RimWorld style based on the decisions that you make over the course of the game. And each of these, the green ones give you buffs. The gray ones are just like stating a fact. You're good at this, but you're bad at this, you know? And then the red ones are bad things. Uh, so I got permissive, for example, where I had an event where I decided to go for a walk uh, and just investigate the ship after everybody had gone to quarters, basically. It, it was kind of like we were on the night shift and not very many people were around. And I caught two of my crew members, without them knowing, uh, making sweet love inside one of the cargo compartments. And that's obviously not allowed in the military. But I decided to let it slide because we're in the equivalent of what is effectively a space world war right now. People need to blow off steam, you know what I mean? If, as long as they don't know that I caught them, there's no harm done here. <laughs> and so, like, if they had seen me come in, I would have to do something about it, but they were unaware that I saw what they were doing, so I figured I'd let it slide. But that gave me permissive, which lowered one of my stats by one. And so, I can get rid of it at some point, I just haven't quite gotten there yet. Uh, but I've got deductions. On top of that, every single one of your characters, so these are your crew chiefs, uh, they follow kind of the designations from Star Trek. You've got specialists, which are effectively like tactics, like the red shirt type guys. You've got engineering, which is like the yellow guys. And you've got science, which is the blue guys. And so each of these guys also have their own stats. There's only three stats for each of the crew members, but they do seem to be consequential. They do seem to stack up and matter as you get further on into the game. And if you have to make specific tests in this game to find out if you're good at something or not. Like, you know, let's say I have to investigate a virus that broke out on a station. My scientists would investigate that, but only the ones with, like, medical skill added on in would really have anything to add to that situation. And so I've tried to have, like, one crew member that's sort of good at each thing, but I've run out of slots. Sort of is what it is. Uh, you can also assign medals to these individuals to customize them a little bit further. Uh, medals are kind of like your game changers. These matter. And so, like, you get extra materials from scrapping. Some of them increase your damage that you deal. Uh, some of them give your guys, like, more HP. I thought I had more medals assigned. That's weird. I feel like I've definitely assigned more medals than this. I know that I had, like, four or five guys with medals on them. Weird. Anyways, you can assign medals to people. As you do achievements in the game, you unlock medals. And you give these guys medals 
and look right here. So these guys get more damage from energy ammo, or these guys get more damage from normal ammo, or it might change the outcomes of your dice rolls when you're doing kind of visual novel stuff. And so there is some customization here, which is really, really nice. You also have departments on board. Uh, so every single kind of cruiser in this game, because you are a cruiser class ship, it's basically kind of like a flying town. Uh, you've got different departments, too. So you've got, like, a scrapping workshop over here. Uh, you can destroy stuff, and everything that you destroy when it comes to scrap that you've recovered from battlefields and enemies that you've defeated and whatnot takes a little while to process, but it'll give you kind of like a total amount of loot. You look up here, these are crafting materials. These crafting materials are useful for manufacturing your own gear because you have an entire kind of printer assembly inside your ship that allows you to manufacture your own gear from blueprints that you recover in combat. You also have research labs. Uh, those blueprints, you plug them into the research lab. They all have a chance to be investigated. Everything comes in different, I guess, marks and tiers. The game also has a Diablo-style loot system where they can be of a differing quality. It doesn't add affixes or anything to the gear, but like a superior quality launch rocket system is going to be objectively way stronger than a normal quality launch rocket system. And so you do want to keep an eye out for things that may potentially have... Do I have any here? I don't. Uh, you want to keep an eye out for things that have, like, green names, blue names, purple names, stuff like that, because they tend to be really good. I think, I, yeah, I've got a purple one right there. I've got a green one right there, a purple one right there. Uh, every gun fires different animation. Or I'm sorry, a different ammunition. In general, you're going to want your bonuses and your fleet loadout to be kind of, like, similar to whatever the weapons are that you wield, like be they machine guns or missiles, you're gonna wanna pick the bonuses that make your particular strategy better. However, there are some balance things to be talked about with this title. There are guns in this game that are effectively kinda like worthless and other guns that are undoubtedly like best in slot what and just that? like annihilate what everything. Public ships doing? Uh, the game is voice acted. Hey, communications and send a transmission request. Yes, sir. Sending transmission request. The bridge terminal lights up with an incoming transmission. A few seconds later, it displays and you see a man with a familiar face. You saw that captain at headquarters during the War Council. Captain LaRouche, we've been waiting for you. And why is that? We're here by order of Admiral Mason. We're to take you and Dr. Banner to her. Come with us. Blood need not be spilled. Yeah, so I have Dr. Banner on board. Dr. Banner was responsible for the Genesis Project, which is effectively the Genesis is the flagship of the Republic Navy, and it is the dopest battleship in the entire world. Uh, they let you fly it for about an hour and a half during the prologue, and then it gets promptly, well, it gets promptly embroiled in controversy. And so we are right now attempting to rebuild the Genesis a la like the Death Star before the Children of the Sun sort of rebuild their super weapon. Unfortunately, there appears to be a civil war brewing in the Republic because some of the other captains appear to be just kind of like breaking off and trying to do their own thing in Republic space. And so, you know, there's, there's never a dull moment when, when you're part of the Navy. Admiral Mason... Us true defenders of the Republic have been necessitated to disregard Flynn and his dogs. Flynn is our direct superior. Obey and Admiral Kendra Mason will explain everything to you. Otherwise, we'll have no choice but to use force. That sounds like a threat to me. It's a warning. We will not allow you to hand over Dr. Banner to Flynn. I would choose to see you perish by our own hands before that happens. You decide. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. We've got superior numbers. It's going to be impossible for someone like you to face off against that many captains. How do I know it's not a trap? If my orders had been to destroy you, I assure you that I would have made that clear by now, Captain. If you agree to come with us, we will escort you to Admiral Mason safe and sound. Otherwise, expect no mercy. Decide, LaRouche. Uh, you're all filthy traitors. A Navy man never gives up his ship. Oh my god, they opened fire, didn't they? All right, let's melt these nerds. Put a little bit of fire on you. The TTK in this game is very, very snappy, but there is no auto-aim. You actually have to lead these ships in six degree of freedom combat, and so that's going to be the big balance, is that time to kill is almost instantaneous in this game if you land like a really, really good fusillade. However, if you're missing a lot, uh, you know, it's not going to go so great. Is that everybody? What are we looking at here? You're making a mistake. Flynn will end up destroying us all. 
I don't think that he will. Uh, the voice acting in this game, it ranges from like decent to passable to god awful to AI, I think. I don't know if there's AI voices in the game. It's kind of hard to tell, but like some of it is very, very clearly human voice acted. And then some of it is like campy and corny enough that I'm like, is that even a human being? I can't tell. Uh, like I said, this game is a, a big old mixed bag that for some reason I've ended up liking probably more than I should just due to the fact that it lets me do battle state like it lets me do battle fleet gothic giant broadside combat all right the rule of cool can can carry a lot of flaws uh, upon seeing that you've wiped out his fleet captain bradley stops the attack and a new incoming transmission appears at your terminal uh, i'm sorry captain i have some bad news for you you really thought you could get rid of us so easily Bring out the prisoner. Two men come into scene pushing a woman in chains. She looks up at you, allowing her to see her f or you to see her face. It's Anna Banner. It's it's Doctor Banner's wife. Uh, sorry, John. I couldn't do anything. You're a dirty rat, Bradley. Anna, damn you all! Don't you lay a finger on her, or you'll pay dearly. There's no need to be rude, Doctor. If you want to see her alive again, I suggest you follow the instructions. We'll send you coordinates to meet with Mason once my crew and I are at a safe distance. And if I were you, I'd make sure to keep Flynn out of this. At the slightest sign that the Admiral's soldiers are heading our way, do not doubt that I will execute your wife myself. Damn it! Well, we have to go after them, Captain. You can't let them hurt her. Don't worry. Kendra wants you. They won't do anything to her while you're with us. We will rescue her. You have my word. Captain, we are receiving Captain Mason's ship's coordinates. The Hedron Gygax sector? I thought it was completely abandoned. Kendra has gone through the trouble of meeting up with us in the most remote location she could find. We should inform of this, Captain. Acting alone is too risky. I know, May, but we don't have a choice. Mason finds out we've informed the Admiral, we could say goodbye to Mrs. Banner. Sacrificing one life to ensure the safety of many is statistically sound. We won't abandon her, May. Let's go to Hedron Gygax. Hedron Gygax, it apparently is that we'll be off on our way to. But the storyline in this game is quite good. It's a slow burner. It probably takes a good five or six hours to really get, like, rolling. And I'm not that far into it, but I have been enjoying the storyline, despite the kind of, like, campy voice acting. All of the writing and the text seems to be quite good, and I've enjoyed the adventure portions of the game, too. Just rolling dice and going through. We haven't got to do a dice roll here on camera yet, but maybe we will. As soon as you arrive, there is a merchant freighter surrounded by pirate ships. Everything indicates that this is the source of the distress signal. Without time to think, they start to open fire on the merchant freighter. Ah, Activate damn it. Well, this is our job. Uh, in general, in Republic space, it's largely frowned upon when you open fire on members of the merchant class for no reason whatsoever. So we'll see if we can put a couple across the bow out here. I don't know if that's going to hit. The good news is I fire so many bullets that even me just kind of being here sort of creates like a flak field. Uh, you do have RPG style abilities in this game, by the way. They're determined by what support systems you have on board. It's highly customizable. As I said earlier, you can have nuclear weapons, things like that. One of my abilities right now is that I can overclock my weapons uh, where they'll fire at like triple the speed for probably like 10 seconds but then they overheat for like three times as long. It's nice for closing the gap with ships that are bigger and nastier than mine. And then I have another one that instantly restores like 40% of my shields in exchange for a little bit of heat. Uh, but there you go. I think we saved the merchant. I count three friendlies on grid. May, send a damage report to my terminal immediately. Okay, so thank you very much, Captain. We thought we were done for. The ships ambushed us near this zone. We tried to flee, but they hunted us down. I don't want to know what would have happened if you hadn't come to our aid. Uh, we can extort them for some of their cargo if we wanted to be a scumbag, Captain, and that's where we would roll a D10, and we have to get a result that's higher than five. This is where your stats come into play. Uh, you know how I had three stats on my Captain when I was showing you the things that we could level up with medals and whatnot? Uh, these matter. They give you more dice. Uh, so you get to roll with advantage, basically, if you've ever played D&D. &D. So if I had, like, a high score at Charisma, like a 7 Charisma, I'd get to roll 3d10 and keep the highest result, which gives us a really solid chance of passing that right there. I don't want to extort these people, though, because I've got, like, a good guy campaign going right now where my captain is, like, by the book and is sort of like a Patrick Stewart and so I don't want to ruin that by being an extortionate monster. When you defeat enemies, uh, you do get their loot, 
and it will pop up. I think the loot text is a little bit too small. It could afford to be bigger. I think that when you do that interaction right there, when the hand fills up all the way, instead of just looting, it should open a little box, and you should click and choose things in a much larger format that lets you look at stats and stuff like that for things you may want to keep. There's really no reason to leave loot behind in this game unless you're, like, really, really full up in your cargo hold, but let's go check out this distress signal over here. We did like a little storyline section, and so I'm interested in, this is why I never get anything done in this game, is because I just free roam all the time. Uh, there seem to be a large variety of ships in this game. I've been to like three or four systems now that all have shipyards in them. Each shipyard has three or four ships, everything from kind of like shipping cruisers uh, to things that look like star destroyers that are definitely getting up there and, you know, getting to like flagship quality. Uh, you detect a distress signal and go to the rescue. When you arrive at the origin, you find a ship with its system shut down in good condition. Uh, let's contact him. Head to the target. May prepare boarding protocol. Boarding is kind of dangerous right here because some of my crew are wounded and I keep forgetting to put them in the sick bay. So we could actually potentially like lose somebody during this little kerfuffle. The game also has music, by the way. Apparently, I had it disabled the last time that I played this game because I was watching a stream or something. But uh, there is music to this game as well. Luckily, the ambient sounds of being in space were good enough for the video. And also, we've been shooting a lot. And so that helped out with kind of disguising the fact, but apparently I had the music disabled. You can boost in this game, but they made the odd decision that when you boost, it drains your shields. I don't know how I feel about that. Uh, the ships are sluggish enough that sometimes you really need to re-maneuver them or you die, like, instantly. But at the same time, draining your shields to boost feels like a weird mechanic to me. I kind of wish it just had, like, a normal boost meter. After nearing the ship, you send a repair team to the distress cruiser. It appears the ship has a grave system error in its energy conduits. Luckily, we have the parts needed to repair those ships. The crew of the other ship offers to repair the damage themselves so as not to delay our mission, and the captain offers one of his best crew members as a volunteer to help us on our quest. Oh, nice. We got a new member of our reserves. And now I can go over to sickbay and heal people too. So there are gunfights in this game. Uh, they're very, very simple. I was hoping one would come up during the course of recording the video, but of course it hasn't. Uh, but there are gunfights in this game. You may have noticed when I was looting that we were picking up submachine guns and sniper rifles and body armor and stuff like that. It's basically a dice game uh, when you go into combat. So basically you roll a die, it has a blank side, it has a targeting side, it has a super target side, and it has a shield side. If you roll the shield side, it puts armor on your crew members. Uh, your crew members all have attack capacity, basically, how hard they hit. And so, it allows the crew members to attack. So, like, let's say you roll a little attack. That means you get four of your crew members get to fire their guns randomly at the enemy, and four random enemies take damage. If you get a big attack face on a die, you get eight shots. Uh, from various crew members but on the in-between you can also use these weapons like consumables uh, so like the smgs oh i can't rotate it right there so you can use these as consumables every single turn of rolling dice you get action points and you can use armor to up armor your crew members and swap out armor plates you can use submachine guns to instantly kill like one of their guys if they don't have armor or sniper rifles to do something similar it's a very very simple sort of tabletop combat system to resolve uh, crew to crew combat, but it does work and it is actually kind of intense like Sometimes when you go up against enemies you get worried that you're gonna lose high-level crew members Which is a huge waste like you definitely don't want to lose high-level crew members if you can help it I need to put people in the sick bay over here. You know, we got a bunch of people who are just like beat to hell Especially Jennifer Thomas. I got in a gunfight right before this recording The game also does make use of these things for storyline purposes. Every now and again, they'll give you something during a quest uh, that requires you to use the research lab to research it, or something that needs to be scrapped in order to advance the storyline along. I thought that was kind of nice. But by and large, this is kind of like a... I wouldn't say it's janky. This is just clearly... Like, this is an older game now that's been in early access for a long time due to its hiatus uh, that I think was made by a team that this was like their first foray into game designing, basically. And so this is one of those games where everything here is gonna be low budget except for the visuals and the narrative portion. And to be fair, the visuals and the narrative portion do a lot of heavy lifting here because the storyline is quite good and I've been enjoying it. Uh, I enjoy flying around the galaxy and whatnot, uh, getting into trouble and just being a space captain. 
But yeah, but here's the thing with Between the Stars. This is a strange game in that it gets a couple of components really right. And because those components are subject to the rule of cool, that tends to carry the components that the game does poorly, of which there are many. So like when it comes to generalized flight information, the game is lacking uh, compared to pretty much every space game that has ever existed. Uh, you don't get any flight information while playing the game. You know how fast you're flying. You know, you don't you don't know anything other than like your gun heat and like how many ticks you have in speed. Basically, uh, the UI itself is chunky. It functions fine, but it's really really busy in some spots, especially where you have a full cargo hold of things that you're trying to compare to your current gear one by one. That's just like a nightmare. Uh, the voice acting is all over the place, and you never quite know what you're going to get with every single storyline sequence, but it does seem to increase in quality as the game goes on towards later patches. Uh, balance is all over the place with regards to gear. Uh, some weapons and modules are next to useless, and other ones are so good that you're stupid not to equip them uh, with the game having such a fast time to kill. And there's not quite enough bridge storylines that pop up randomly while flying around. You'll start seeing repeats after, like five to ten hours that section taken care of this game has exceptional graphics though it's a really good looking game it has a really cool firing model uh, when it comes to the artillery weapons it has really fun if overly simple huge battleship punch-up combat it has an incredibly epic main narrative storyline that surprised me for such a budget title and even a big chunk of the little side stories are really well written and had me kind of like hurriedly running down the next step to figure out what happened to these characters that I meet. Uh, the biggest problem in the room, though, is that the game is overpriced. At $30 right here, this is one of those things that I've seen kind of like recurring in the industry. Um, maybe it's just been happening a lot lately. It's where I've got like this game, that it's got some flaws, but it's also got some really cool parts too. And I can weave my way through those, and it's easy for me to advise you guys and talk about the things that I do and I don't like. But when I get to something that's hard set like price, I am forced here as being consumer facing to now start Googling around and figuring out what other games that I think are better than your game uh, are selling for. And what I came up with is that you can get X3 and all of its DLC for cheaper than this game. Uh, you can also go ahead and get yourself Star Sector for like 15 bucks and that's one of the greatest space games to ever exist. The original Everspace is on sale right now for $3.99. You know what I mean? And so it's just like this game is also on sale. I had to actually re-record this section because the sale went live and I know there's going to be a sale. It was $30. Now the game is $20 on sale, but that should be marked down way, way, way further. Your window is much more closed than that, in my opinion, just because the game has been in early access for so long. They had to use money from this game to go and get, you know, Traveler's Rest and that game got super successful. Then they had to come back after a hiatus to get working on this one again. There's a complicated development history here. And, and so anyways, at a $30 price point, it becomes much more difficult for me to apologize for the flaws that exist inside of a game. It's also much more difficult for me to shine a light on the good parts of a game when I think that it's overpriced. Right now on Steam, you can get the game for $20 on sale. At that price point, I'd say if you like battlecruiser combat and you like the sort of D&D choose-your-own-adventure gameplay that they're pitching and you don't mind a sort of clunky UI and balance and polish issues and things of that nature, you'll probably get 20 bucks out of it. I played for like 10, 12, 13 hours preparing for this video right here, and I enjoyed it all the way through. So there you go. That makes it worth it. But at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't spend on $30. And so that's one of those things you're going to have to weigh for yourself. I like the game. I think it's really cool. I thought it was enjoyable despite the flaws, but I also got this game for free like five years ago when it came out. I didn't Kickstarter it, you know, I didn't put any money into this title. I'm like shrug about it. It comes out when it comes out. You as a consumer need to think about the fact that like, eh, Star Sector is out there, you know what I mean? 20 bucks more and you get X4, which is like an enormous thousand hour experience. And so anyways, this is one of those titles that I personally like very much because there's so few games that allow me to do giant hundred guns to a side combat in battle cruisers and giant carriers and things like that. It's very, very rare. A lot of games don't let me do that, especially in six degrees of freedom. Uh, this game lets me do that, which is why I end up liking it. And it does have some really good writing. This was a tough one for me. It really sincerely was, but I do like the game at the end of the day. I did find it enjoyable. At no point during my playing of this game was I ever just like, ugh, this is a slog. It was an easy 13 hours to throw at the game, and I think that also says something. Uh, I will see you all tomorrow with something hot and fresh off the indie skillet. 
for right now. This is Between the Stars, updating my coverage on it because I haven't covered it in a very, very long time. And I think they just released the last chapter of the narrative storyline. And so I figured it was time to update that coverage and move into the future. I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thank you for hanging out with me. And that's all I got for you. Bye, folks.